about to leave Already packing, come with me I'm not really asking We'll get away to a place where we don't know About to see the world in action What we can be, life with no distractions We'll get away, this is what we waited for everyone and welcome uh, to our third A-Level Law live revision blast. It's Jim here at Tutor HQ and tonight I'm joined by actually three familiar faces if you've been to one of our uh, two previous sessions. Uh, we've got Gemma top right, I'm just looking at the right screen here which must mean that Liz is top left and therefore Sarah bottom left and uh, we are focusing on the third of our series on, on crime. Property offences is the subject tonight. Uh, I'm Sarah will probably give us a quick introduction before we get into the first activity. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping to start with. If you're joining us live on YouTube, and of course you can also watch now live on Facebook, uh, here's your chance to get involved in the activities by typing your responses into the chat window on YouTube or the comments on uh, the Facebook page. And that's a great way for Gemma and Liz and Sarah to see how you're getting on with the activities. You don't have to, but it's a good thing to do. Don't be shy. Give it a go. If you're watching on catch up or replay, then of course you've got the chance to uh, to pause the video and to work, give yourself a bit more time on the activities. But we won't see how you're getting on. That's just up between you and your answers to see how you're getting on with these activities. Uh, Sarah, how are we doing? Should we should we just give us a quick overview as to what we're covering in this session before we crack on? Yep. So thanks, Jim. As um, Jim said, it's uh, property offences focus for this evening. We've got around 30 minutes of fast paced revision style activities uh, based around retrieval practice. So there's lots of fun games some picture quizzes and some multiple choice questions as well. As Jim says, please play along. It always makes for a little bit more interesting when uh, we can interact with the chat too. Yeah, fantastic. I'll keep an eye on the live chat and maybe have a go at some of the questions as well. And uh, yeah, let's make a start, shall we? Here we go. Yep. 
Okay, then first up then, this is a crack the code activity. So as the instructions on screen suggest, you need to put the sections of theft in order of how they appear in the theft act. We can't actually proceed with this game until the correct code has been entered into a chat. So if you're on Facebook or if you're on YouTube, you can play along. And the aim of the game is to pop the letters into the chat in the correct order. So which section of theft comes first, according to the act? Which one would be second, third, fourth and fifth? Oh, straight in with a, uh, an answer there, Fab. We've got a couple of answers coming in now. Fab, a few more answers coming in. And that looks like the code has been cracked. All the answers that have come in so far have been the same. Um, so as you can see on screen, the code has been cracked um, and very, very quickly. So well done there. Um, theft Act does state that theft is dishonestly appropriating property, belonging to another with the intention to permanently deprive. OK, Jim, shall we go into the next game? So this part is a multiple choice quiz. So again, play along in the chat. If you're playing at home, you can pause and take a little bit longer if you're wanting to write down your answers to these ones. So question number one. Uh, it says section one of the Theft Act 1978 contains the definition of theft. Do you think that that's true or false? And again, if you just pop into the chat, either A or B, so we can see your answers. And as Jim says in the chat, 50-50 chance of getting it right. So we've had a few mixed different responses so far. So what do you think? Theft Act 1978 contains the definition of theft. Do you think that's true or false? Excellent. Well spotted there, Ellie. Um, Ellie is the one who has actually spotted the correct answer. Most people would probably read that and be easily mistaken to believe that Section 1 of the Theft Act does contain theft. Uh, Jim, at Tutor to You HQ, does also agree that it should be the Theft Act. Uh, the reason that this one is false is because of the date. So well spotted, Ellie. Um, the date is 1968 for the Theft Act. We actually do have two Thefts Acts. There is a Theft Act in 1978, but that contains fraud additions. Okay, Jim, next question. Okay, question two, which of the following would be classed as property? So we've got fruit that's growing on an allotment and wildflowers that are growing in the woods. Which one would be classed as property and therefore can be stolen? And again, we can see some answers coming through in the chat. So which one of these would be classed as property and the other one therefore would not? Lots of the same answers coming through here. Jim, do you want to reveal the answer? So well done, guys, in the chat. All correct there. The um, correct answer would be fruit that's growing on an allotment. Now, the difference between those two is that one belongs to somebody. So fruit growing on an allotment would belong to somebody. Wildflowers, as we know, because they're growing wild in nature, they do not belong to anybody. So under Section 4, they would not be classed as property. Next question, Jim. Question three, what does section two of the Theft Act include? Is it the definition of dishonesty or is it circumstances of when the defendant would not be classed as dishonest? So again, same as before, A or B in the chat to which one you think is correct. So does it include the definition or does it include the circumstances when somebody would not be dishonest? We have a few more mixed responses on this one, so I'll just give a few more seconds for anybody else who would like to put their opinions forward, which one you think it might be. And Jim, if you can reveal the correct answer for us. It is B, so there was a mixed response on this one. Um, dishonesty is covered by Section 2, but we don't actually have a statutory definition of dishonesty. So what actually falls under Section 2 of the Theft Act is circumstances which would be considered when the defendant is not dishonest. We have three circumstances where the defendant would not be dishonest. So we have uh, subsection 1A, which is where the defendant believes that they have a legal right to the property. We have subsection 1B, which is where the defendant believes that the owner would consent to them 
having the property or taking the property and subsection 1c where the owner cannot actually be found by taking reasonable steps so we consider that that may be abandoned property and therefore doesn't have an owner so the definition of dishonesty does not actually come from the statute so linking into that question then what is the most recent case that we can use for dishonesty and this case is actually the case that we would define dishonesty through so because we don't have a statutory definition we use common law so again if we just use the chat here guys which one do we think is the correct case for dishonesty for the definition So quite a few answers coming through the chat now, through Facebook and through YouTube. Slight mix of responses, but mostly going with the same response here. Jim, can you give us the answer, please? So the correct answer is the Barton and Booth case of 2020. So it is a brand new case. Um, it has replaced the old law and it's recently confirmed the civil law, which was Ivy versus Genting Casinos in 2017, if anybody's studied that one in class as well. Uh, so it now does give us the common law definition of dishonesty to support the statute. And it looks at what the defendant's state of knowledge or belief was um, as to the facts. And then objectively, it looks at whether the conduct is dishonest by the standards of the ordinary decent people. So that would be the test that we would now use for dishonesty, the standards of the ordinary decent pe people, which is objective. So it confirmed Ivy and it replaced the older test of Gosh. Okay, next question, Jim. No copying, Jim. What is the maximum sentence for theft? So we have seven years or we have double that, 14 years. What do we think for the correct sentence? Rubina, I would be expecting you to get these answers right. <laughs> so correct sentence for theft, what do we think? And Jim, if you reveal the answer for us. It is seven years imprisonment. Uh, so that is also found within the Theft Act. It's actually found under Section 7, which tends to be a little bit easier to remember with it being seven years. But seven years imprisonment is found under Section 7 of the Theft Act 1968. Uh, 14 years is for burglary of a dwelling, but seven years would be for theft. Next question, please, Jim. What case involves swapping supermarket labels? So you may or may not have studied this case. I will give a little bit of context to the case as well. Um, and it links to appropriation. So we have Morris or we have Oxford v Mosh. You may have studied one of these cases, so you can answer this by process of elimination. Or you may have studied both of them. But quite a famous case for appropriation. And it involves swapping supermarket labels. What do we think? So lots of answers coming in there for the same option. Jim, if you give us the answer, please. It is the RV Morris case. I tend to remember this by Morrison's. I don't think Morrison's was the supermarket in question, but it's the easiest way for me to remember this one. Um, so Morris is where the defendant did swap supermarket labels and it was held to be appropriation. So the defendant assumed the rights of the owner, which is the definition for appropriation, by swapping those supermarket labels. You may have also studied that second case there of Oxford and Moss. We use that for property and it helps us to determine what is and is not property. And in that case, it decided that information alone would not be property. So where some students snuck into an exams office and looked at an exam paper, information alone would not be theft. But we know in Morris, swapping labels would be. Next question, please, Jim. If you receive property by mistake, are you allowed to keep it? So if you're accidentally overpaid, for instance, or you receive some kind of items by mistake, can you keep them? True or false? You can keep them true. You're not allowed to false. And a bit of a bonus here as you're answering, does anybody know the section that this falls under in the Theft Act? So we've got quite a few responses coming in. None for the section yet. So on top of your response, do you also know the section that tells us this? Where in the Theft Act do we find this information? 
And Fab Malika was first there. Fab Malika. Valerie, excellent. Okay, Jim, if you reveal the answer, please. So the answer is false. You're not allowed to keep it if it's a mistake. As soon as you realise the mistake, you should let the original owner or the legal owner know of the mistake and repay. So if it's money, for instance, you should repay that money. If it's an item, that should be returned. And the correct section was identified in the chat, which is section five, subsection four. Uh, we also have a case in law, the Attorney General's reference. It's number one of 1983, which you may or may not have studied, depending on uh, what cases you do study for theft. But it's quite a useful one for this section. Um, it was actually a policewoman, so quite interestingly facts, considering policewomen should know the law and be upholding the law. And she was over and when she kept that, that um, class of theft. You overkeep things when property is being given by mistake, that would amount to theft. Next question, please, Jim. Okay, similar question here, if you're overpaid again, but this time on a gambling bet, are you allowed to keep it? True or false? What do we think? So I've been quite specific on this question. We know the law, section 5-4. What about gambling? So again, if you pop your answers in the chat to what you think it might be. And Malika, very quick there. A few more coming in. Fab. Jim, will you reveal the answer, please? It is true for this one, um, which is a little bit odd, really, because it contradicts the law, doesn't it, that we've just discussed. Section 5 4 says we're not allowed to keep things when we're overpaid or given by mistake. And yet, if it's in the area of gambling, we are. There is a case called Gilks, which covers this one, and it is looked at as a gift. So you are allowed to keep it if it's gambling. So a slight loophole there in the law. Next question, please, Jim. If you borrow money, what must you return in terms of that money? So do you return the exact same coins and notes as you borrowed or do you just need to return the exact same value of what you've borrowed in order for it to not be theft? So a few answers coming in. And Jim, if you reveal the answer for us. So it is the exact same coins and banknotes. It does, of course, depend on the level of dishonesty as well. So the couple of people who answered B could technically be correct here if the person wasn't dishonest, if the person who you borrowed money from knew about it. Um, if you just take the money, then it is the exact same coins and banknotes. And there's a case of Balumiel that um, covers this and that held that the exact same coins and notes must be returned. So it's quite difficult if somebody does take money without the person's consent because the exact same money needs to be returned. How you'd prove that could be quite interestingly, how you'd prove the exact same coins and notes. Perhaps we notes they have serial numbers so you could probably track those. And finally, question 10, what case involves students spending her flatmate's gas bill money on Christmas presents? So this was a student accommodation and they had paid or clubbed together for the gas bill money. It was in December and she spent it on Christmas presents. Anybody know this case? And again, you may study this case or you may not. It might be an extra one to consider. So a few answers very quick there, guys. Well done. Uh, Jim, do you want to give us the answer? It is that Davidge and Boonet case. And that's the one that tells us that um, if you're given money with a specific obligation or a specific purpose, you must only spend it for that obligation or purpose. So it was theft when she spent it on Christmas presents. OK, um, next up then we have Gemma with the big reveal. Hi guys, so we've done this sort of um, activity previously. We are going to reveal some different clues and from the clues, can you work out the key case before all of the clues are actually revealed? Okay, so the first clue, let's see who's gonna be the first to name the correct case. This case concerned robbery. So let's get thinking about some of those robbery cases that um, we've been learning. Can anybody put any robbery cases in the chat? Let's go for clue number two. We've got some cases already coming up. This case is um, a case that was heard in 1976. 
So get thinking there, not one of the recent cases that you've learned, a 1976 case. Got some guesses already. This third clue might help you out a bit more. This was where defendant one nudged the victim, causing them to lose balance. Now, remember, robbery is theft plus force. And this case was talking about um, the force that was needed and very little force was actually needed in this case to determine that nudging was force. Okay, so we've got some more, some more guesses there. Good on you guys. Okay, let's go for our fourth clue. So defendant one nudged the victim, causing them to lose their balance. And when they were nudged and they're off balance, defendant two stole the victim's wallet. See a classic robbery case there with a bit of theft and force. Okay, and then the fifth clue, force is to be given its ordinary meaning. And it was decided in this case, it's up to the jury to decide. Nudging was sufficient to amount to force. It was decided in this case. Okay, so let's see who got it right. Loads of you. Well done there. Well done, everybody, for getting it right. I think Ellie was the first one there. It is, of course, um, Dawson and Jane's. They said that nudging is enough to be forced. Very little force is um, needed. And um, force is, is not defined in the Theft Act. So we needed that case law to define um, what level of force is needed. Well done. Good work there. Okay, so we're moving on to our next one. This is a bit of a, like a quiz show game. You've got one minute, so it's pretty fast paced, guys. Okay, you're going to have to be on it. You have one minute to answer the six questions that are going to pass by on the conveyor belt. So we need speed and accuracy. Okay, good luck, guys. Go. Let's get this conveyor belt moving. Type the answer as each question passes. First question, what Act of Parliament contains the law on robbery? Type it in the chat box. Question two, what section of the Act is robbery found under? Question three, the quick these. What must first be committed in order to prove the actus reus of robbery? Four, in addition to theft, what else must be present for the actus reus of robbery? Five, is true or false? Threat amount of force for the purpose of robbery and six what is the mens rea for robbery well that was that was pretty pretty swift that wasn't it that minute went quickly there i thought but well done for all those answers that came whizzing in okay so let's have a look at the answers okay so the first question that was really quick okay what act of parliament contains the law on robbery okay let's have a look at the answer it is of course the theft act 1968 that was referred to in um the, one of the multiple choice questions that Sarah went through right at the beginning. Yes, it's the Theft Act 1968. And I saw lots of answers coming in there. So well done. Moving on from that, question two, what section of the Act is robbery found under? Of course, it's section eight. We've got theft in section one and we've got robbery in section eight. Lots of correct answers on that. Then what must be committed um, first in order to prove the actus reus of robbery? Of course, it's got to be a theft. You've got to have your completed theft um, in order to um, start to establish a robbery.
Question four. In addition to the theft, what else must be present for the actus reus of robbery? Force. Now, it's force, but a force can be immediately um, before, at the time um, of the robbery and for the purpose of um, stealing. Remember, it's um, a continuing act, the um, robbery. Um, the theft, so it's um, in hail. Um, it can be immediately before, at the time of, for the purpose of um, stealing. And then last um, question five, um, threats can amount to force for the purpose of robbery. Is this true or false? Of course, it's true. Um, the defendant must seek to put the victim in fear. They don't actually need to be in um, fear, but um, the threats can amount to um, force as well. We've got some case law on that. Um, you might have studied Bentham, where somebody put um, their fingers inside their jacket pocket, so it looked like they had a gun, and that was enough. And then our last question on our quick, our very quick fire conveyor belt quiz. What's the mens rea for robbery? It's intention to steal, the theft. You've got to have the intention um, for the, the completed theft. And also intention or recklessness to use force. And there was lots of people who got that as well. So really well done. That was um, really testing our quick recall skills. And of course, we need to be... Um, remembering this really swiftly in the exam. So well done, guys, to everybody who completed that. OK, um, so we'll move on to Liz now, who's going to um, look at some aspects of burglary, I believe. That's great. Thank you very much. So um, for the remainder of the session, we have got two more activities which are focused on burglary. So already, obviously, you've had a look at theft and robbery, and the remaining two are just focused on the two burglary offences. The burglary is a really unique offence. Um, it's very interesting. There's lots of very interesting cases, but students often quite find burglary quite a challenging uh, subject to study, um, and particularly to get their head around in terms of um, the distinction between those two offences, which is quite subtle, so between section 91A and section 91B. So I won't say anything more because I'm going to start revealing answers for this activity. So what you need to do on this table activity is you need to identify which of these words or cases link to burglary. OK, so what you need to do um, if you're watching this live, uh, work your way through um, the boxes and just type into the chat um, anything that you can see that's associated with burglary. So um, Valerie's already got some in, well done. Um, so if um, if you're watching this on catch up, what you can do is pause the video um, and you can work your way through each of them and think about is that something that's associated with burglary. So as you are looking through, just type into the chat. It doesn't matter if you write multiple different times. Um, type into the chat the different uh, what the words or the cases that are linked to burglary. Think about the actus reus, the mens rea. Think about the statute. Uh, Valerie's got another one. Very well done. Um, we're trying to find quite a few here. So um, yeah, do look through them all one by one. We'll just wait another few seconds to see if anyone else could pop anything into the chat. So maybe start at the top and work your way logically through. Valerie's having a very good evening. Valerie's got even more. Well done. Uh, anybody else want to pop into the chat What, uh, which of the words or cases are linked to some aspect of burglary which you have to study? Okay, so uh, this might be a good opportunity to reveal the answers. We have got some answers in the chat, which is really, really fantastic. Great. So, uh, and yet yeah, lots more answers coming in. So well done. Thank you all. Um, so lots of words or cases here which are linked to burglary. Um, so enters. Um, enters is a common element of actus reus for section 91A and section 91B. So in an exam question, if you're actually going through and applying the law of burglary, um, enters would be the first thing which you uh, which you talk about. Um, An entry is actually a question, just a question of fact. And um, as we know from uh, some of the cases, um, which we are coming to in a minute, actually only part of the body needs to be inside of the building for there to be an entry. 
So it's fairly permanent structure, uh, which was one that a couple of you picked up on, well done. Um, you have to prove that the defendant has entered a building or part of a building as a trespasser. And um, a kind of key common law understanding of the building or part of the building requirement, so it's not, it's phrased in something in the statute, but is that the building or part of the building required is, uh, must be a fairly permanent structure. So the theft act was also a correct answer here. So well done if you got that one. Um, burglary is contained within the theft act. So I always think that these offences fit quite nicely together because sections one to seven of the theft act um, are on the law of theft. You've then got section eight for robbery and section nine for burglary. So it's all nice and neat in terms of teaching it. The case of R.V. Walkington um, is a burglary case, so hopefully you identified that one. This was a really, really interesting case because the defendant in this case actually um, was inside a department store. And obviously you are generally um, guests, you're lawful visitors in department stores, they would like you to go in and look around. What they wouldn't like you to do um, is then go behind um, like the till area, for example. So the defendant in this case went behind an unoccupied till area, opened the um, till to see if there was any cash in there, and he was convicted of Section 91A burglary because he entered that part of the building. Even though there wasn't necessarily a physical barrier, he entered part of the building as a trespasser and he had that intent to steal if there was cash in there. So trespasser is the next one. So as I said, entry to a building or part of a building as a trespasser. These are the three actus reus elements that are common to both of the offences. Um, and this means that as a question of fact, the defendant did not have permission to be there. Um, you can become a, you can be a trespasser um, in somewhere where you would usually have permission, but if you enter um, in excess of your permission, um, so there's a very famous case of Smith and Jones where I think it was a son went to his father's house and stole a television, and his father said he's got permission to be in his house, my house, whenever he wants, but because he entered with intent to steal, he didn't have permission to enter for that reason, therefore he was a trespasser. So section nine was right because, as I said, that's where the two offences are contained. Building a part of a building is a key element of actus reus for both of the offences. Um, the case of R.V. Ryan, which is always an interesting case to study, um, in this case, the defendant was actually um, wedged in the window um, to a kitchen of a home and he had his head and his right arm stuck in. The rest of his body was outside. Um, and actually, the fire brigade um, had to come and take him out. There must have been a very awkward conversation or an awkward wait uh, while the fire brigade were arriving. Um, he protested his uh, liability for burglary for many reasons, one being that he couldn't have actually stolen anything because he was stuck. Um, and secondly, uh, because did he actually enter? Only his head and his right arm were in there. That was sufficient. He was convicted of Section 91A burglary. So um, well done for everybody who commented in the chat. The next thing that activity, the final one for tonight, um, is the suitcase scanner. I love this activity. Um, so what we are asking you, I think there's four um, slides, I believe. Um, is this a building for the purpose of burglary? So something that I touched upon um, is that an element of access rights for both offences is that they have to have entered a building or part of the building as a trespasser. The, um, Welcome to Heathrow, what I thought. Um, they, um, in the statute, it doesn't actually define what a building is. Um, we know from the common law definitions that it's um, something which has some degree of uh, permanence. Um, but uh, yeah, they do give, there is a phrase that they give us within, um, I think it's section 93, if I recall it rightly off the top of my head, where they um, give us some information about what can be included as a building for the purpose of burglary. So um, if we get going with the first one, so the scanner will move across your screen. So comment in the chat, would this be regarded as a building or part of a building for the purposes of burglary? So pop your comments in the chat. Is this a building for the purpose of burglary? Okay, so um, just pop yes or no in the chat. If you wanted to add in a little explanation as to why your answer is yes or why your answer is no, that would be really fabulous to see. So what we're asking you is if somebody, so obviously that was like a, a mobile home, if uh, somebody broke into that and stole from that, would it be burglary? Okay, so if we reveal the answer, the answer is yes. So well done to those of you that put yes. 
the key phrase which they actually give us in the statute is um, it includes um, building includes an inhabited vehicle at, um, or vessel. So we've got another saying, yes, fairly permanent and designed for habitation, perfect. So the statute tells us it also includes any inhabited vehicle or vessel, and it also includes times where um, a vehicle or vessel isn't actually inhabited. So actually, if this was parked, if this was uh, parked up somewhere and the residents weren't actually in it at that particular time, um, but somebody broke in, entered it as a trespass, so that could still be burglary. Okay, so. Um, I'd love one of them too. Um, so the next one, we shall see through the suitcase scanner now. Okay, so you can see a tent, possibly slightly colder if you were sleeping in it than the last thing we saw in our suitcase scanner. So what we are asking you is, is a tent a building for the purpose of burglary? So if somebody went into someone else's tent, might happen at a festival possibly um, and took something or they went in with an intention to steal would that amount to burglary so Charlie has said no if we reveal the answer is a tent a building completely right Charlie well done the answer is no so a tent uh, <laughs> there's a good uh, tent stroke there um, the tent is not a permanent structure there's no degree of permanence it is portable and designed to be portable therefore that's not a building for the purposes of burglary if somebody went in there and took something uh, that they weren't entitled to it could still be theft it doesn't mean that there's no offense but the appropriate one's not burglary okay so the next one for us to see in the suitcase scanner mm, so in this picture we have a narrow boat in the midst of winter looking a little bit chilly on there possibly so you could pop your answer in the chat if you are watching this live um that <laughs> charlie's just called you out for a dad joke there uh with the intense bit um so is this a burg a burglary is this a building for the purpose of burglary so charlie has indicated that he thinks it's yes um, so the maximum, Julia's also just said, what are the maximum sentences for theft and burglary? That's a really interesting question. The a maximum sentence for theft is seven years. For burglary, um, the maximum sentence depends for both, depends upon um, whether um, the burglary is of a dwelling or a non-dwelling. So if the burglary is of a non-dwelling, um, I think I recall correctly, the maximum sentence is 10 years. Um, and if it's of a dwelling, so somebody resides there, somebody lives there, it's their home, it's 14 years. So it's much more serious to, for somebody to burgle a dwelling where somebody lives, um, their kind of home, the, the space they feel safe in. So um, we shall reveal, was on, is our narrow boat a building? Yes, it is, because it is an inhabited vehicle or vessel. Um, so therefore it is covered, even if the, the residents who are inhabiting it weren't there, even if it was unoccupied whilst the burglary took place. Uh, we've got some more jokes coming in uh, regarding narrow boats. Um, okay, so we've got the final one. Is this a burg... I keep on uh, merging burglary and building, apologies. This is a building for the purposes of burglary. I'm trying to get out. So the suitcase scanner is showing us uh, we've got like a lorry container here. OK, so comments in the chat. Is this a building for the purposes of burglary? There are actually a couple of cases on this point which you might have studied. It can be. So Charlie said it's can, it can be. Well done. Any other thoughts? Anyone think definitely yes, definitely no? Feel free to pop into that shipping container. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. A lorry container. Oh, yeah, uh, apologies. Uh, yes, so, um, uh, yeah, so things like shipping containers, freezer containers. Um, so sometimes there can, you can have the big trailers that go onto the back of lorries, um, which uh, can be used for storage. So um, any other um, comments in the chat about whether the shipping container could be a building? There are a couple of cases, like I said, on these kind of areas regarding kind of containers, trailers um, that you might have studied. BNS v Leavely. You've also got Norfolk Constabulary, um, which was against seeking and gold. So if we reveal the answer for this one, and the answer, and Charlie, you uh, put it exactly right there, so very well done. It does depend on the structure. 
So um, containers, storage containers, um, whether it be kind of shipping or freezer or lorry, um, whether there's no definitive test about whether that will uh, automatically be a building or not a building, it will depend upon the nature of that structure. So it will depend upon um, is things like is it connected to the electricity supply? In the case of Norfolk Constabulary, a lorry trailer was not a building even though it had only been used for storage for a year, because it still had wheels. So therefore that meant it predominantly remained a vehicle rather than a building. It was in the case of BNSB Leafly, there's a freezer container which has been used as storage, uh, storage for two years. And some of the factors which led the court to conclude that actually that was a building for the purposes of burglary, um, is that it was actually rested on sleepers and that it had an electricity supply. So therefore there was clearly a degree of permanence to ca um, characterise it as a building. Okay, so that has brought us to the end of the activities for burglary. Wow. Fantastic stuff. Fascinating stuff, isn't it? What constitutes a building for the purpose of burglary? I think I've lived in all four of those over the years, <laughs> but uh, never been burgled. Fantastic. Awesome. Uh, great session. Many thanks uh, to Liz and to Gemma and Sarah for taking us through that. We whizzed through there in, what, 35 minutes or so, just less. Uh, a whole load of stuff on uh, property offences. Hopefully you found it useful. If you did and you're live, give us a thumbs up on either YouTube or Facebook. And also, if you're watching on uh, Catch Up, watching on replay, that would be great as well. Uh, Sarah, what's the plan? What's what's our next topic? I know we've got lots more of these planned over the coming weeks and obviously beyond into to next term. What do we think we might do next? Have we decided yes? So we've got, yeah, we've got defences next. So we're doing general defences next week and then we're going to do the mental capacity defences the week after. Same Fantastic. time, um, 6.30 on a Thursday, same link. Fantastic. Obviously, uh, we never know whether someone's got an assessment coming up or an exam or they're just starting out. So everybody who joins us on these sessions is more than welcome, whether you join us live or catch up and replay. It's a really useful way of uh, revising some key topics in hopefully quite a fun and uh, interactive way there. Really enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, so from Sarah and from Gemma and from Liz and from myself, hopefully your studying is going well and we'll catch you on our next A-Level Law Revision Blast. But for now, see you later and thank you. See you later, guys. Thank you. Bye.